As we continue to learn about attitudes, let's focus now on persuasion, which is a very interesting topic. And what we'll talk about in this video specifically are two different routes to persuasion. So now that we know the basics about attitudes, it makes sense to focus on how attitudes are changed. And that's what persuasion is all about. And I think it's important to keep this in mind. Persuasion is a natural part of our daily lives because we don't always see things eye to eye with people. We don't always see things the same way. But at some point, we need to agree and be able to move on or else we're going to be stuck. That means that at least one person is going to have to change their attitude somewhat. So in this sense, persuasion is really very useful because it greases the wheels of society. Some people would call it a social lubricant. It allows us to move along without getting stuck. We are constantly trying to persuade people to change their minds, to change their attitudes. And that's what persuasion is all about. It's the process by which attitudes are changed. Persuasion typically occurs via some type of interpersonal communication. So it could be via spoken words. It could be via written words. It could even be via some type of image or graphic that conveys some story. So here would be a good example of an advertisement. So although you might not think about it this way, this is an interpersonal communication. This is a communication between the people who make the Mini Cooper and you. And they understand that you think the Mini Cooper is cute, but they want you to also understand that the Mini Cooper is a performance car. And they're using a graphic to try to help you understand that this thing is a beast. So it's a simple persuasive appeal using some images to try to get you to change your mind to try to persuade you to think differently about the Mini Cooper. Well, social psychologists are interested in understanding how these types of appeals might work and why these types of appeals might work. So that's why we're going to delve into them. We process these basic interpersonal communications in one of two basic ways. And that's what Petty and Cassiopo's dual process model is all about. According to this dual process model, we either process this information via a central route or a peripheral route. Let's talk about each one just real quickly, and then we'll talk about each one in detail. Central route processing occurs when people are thinking really critically about some type of persuasive communication. And in those situations, the only time that they're going to be persuaded is going to be based on the strength of that message. If there's a strong message, they're likely to be persuaded. If the message is weak, they're unlikely to be persuaded. Now, in these situations, when that message is given to the audience, if the people have a high ability to actually process that information and they're motivated to process that information, then they're likely to take that central route. And that route, as I mentioned, could lead to persuasion. But that's only one path to persuasion. Peripheral route processing occurs when people are not thinking critically about that message, but they still might be persuaded by some other superficial cues. So let's take it from the beginning. Again, there's some type of message that's given to some audience, you, me, whoever. But I might not have the ability to really process some complicated message. I might not be motivated to process some complicated message. So I might pay attention to some peripheral cues, some things that are unrelated to the actual message. For example, maybe the person who's delivering the message is good looking. Maybe the person who's delivering the message is speaking really quickly and really clearly and seems to really know what they're talking about. And instead of scrutinizing that message, I might just simply say to myself, well, it seems like he knows what he's talking about. I'm convinced. And thus, the peripheral route as well could lead to persuasion. So what key factors determine if somebody's going to process a persuasive message via the central route or the peripheral route? There are really two key factors. One has to do with willingness or motivation. I simply might not be motivated to listen to all your arguments and carefully scrutinize your message. In that situation, if I lack motivation, I'm going to simply pay attention to some peripheral cues. So in that situation, I'm likely to take the peripheral route. Another key factor has to do with my ability. So for example, I might be pressed for time. If I don't have a lot of time and I have to make a decision, I cannot carefully process your persuasive appeal. And thus, I might not carefully process that persuasive appeal, but I'm going to pay more attention to some of those peripheral cues. And thus, I'm going to take the peripheral route. All right, let's talk about each one of these routes in just a little bit more detail. We'll talk about the central route first. 
It might be helpful to better understand central and peripheral route processing by first talking for a minute about some early models of persuasion. These early models were based on what we call a normative way of thinking. And the whole idea was human thought was understood to be almost computer-like. And we believed that people processed information in a very rational way. So what these researchers thought back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was that if you were going to persuade someone by some type of persuasive communication, they would have to pay attention to that message. They would have to fully comprehend that message. They would have to learn from that message what you're trying to teach them. They would have to accept that. And then they would have to retain that information. And that's a whole heck of a lot of stuff going on right there. So in order for persuasion to take place, all of that processing had to take place. That's what a normative model would predict. But these normative models failed to account for persuasive appeals that were successful in which learning a message was completely unnecessary. So look at this ad right here. It's an ad for a Lexus. And you can see there, there's no real message to scrutinize. There's nothing I'm trying to teach the person. There's no argument that I'm using to try to persuade them. All I'm really doing is linking up my car with some beautiful model. Now, I'm not saying that this particular persuasive message is successful, but we do know that persuasive campaigns that use these types of techniques, they are indeed often very successful. And a normative model that links human thinking with almost computer processing, that can't account for this. So it's important to understand that this dual process model that we're talking about is a descriptive model. And descriptive models are more human-based. So to some extent, they can account for our rationality and our irrationality. Well, central route processing is clearly a rational strategy. Recall that on the central route, people are very carefully scrutinizing a message, and they're very influenced by the strength of those arguments. One way to think about this is that central route processing is an elaborative process. And all that means is that people are engaging in a lot of deep thought. They're carefully scrutinizing the strength of the message and its arguments, and as they do, new thoughts and new questions that they need to consider come to their mind. And as a result, central route processing is simply a very involved type of mental processing. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we're all interested in buying a Porsche. So we might look for an advertisement where this type of car is being shown. And in this particular ad, there's a ton of information. Now, most people, most of the time, aren't interested in processing all that information, but we're about to spend a lot of money, so we're really involved here. And I've got some time. I don't need to buy this car right now. So the bottom line is I am willing to process all this information. I am motivated to process this information because if I'm going to spend all this money, I want to make sure I get the car that I really want. So if I'm gonna scrutinize all this information about how much the car costs and how fast it can go and what kind of mileage it can get, and I need to understand that there are all these different types of models that I can buy, if I've got the time and I've got the ability and I process all that information, as long as these arguments are strong, and they are strong, this is a very fast car, it has a very high top speed, and it gets decent gas mileage for a sports car. So if there are very strong arguments and I scrutinize all those arguments, I'm going to be persuaded by this message, by this advertisement. So think of all that just went into us trying to determine if we we're going to buy that car. Because we processed all that information very carefully, the attitude that we have now formed, the attitude that changed from our original attitude, we're now feeling very confident about that car, is likely to be quite strong. So as a result of central route processing, attitude change tends to be relatively enduring. It tends to be resistant to counterattack because you know we know all that information. If somebody wanted to challenge me and if it was smart to purchase that car, I've already done a lot of thinking about it. I could defend myself. And thus, attitudes that are changed via the central route also tend to be predictive of future behavior. All right, keep this in mind though. Central route processing is indeed very rational, but people still do fall prey to bias types of thinking, such as confirmation biases. So if I really wanted to buy that Porsche to begin with, I might be looking for information that confirms my initial beliefs that the Porsche is a good car. 
So my point is simply that even though central route processing involves a lot of thought, we're still human. And that means that we're naturally plagued by a variety of cognitive biases. All right, let's talk just a little bit more now about peripheral route processing. You'll recall that that dual process model of persuasion is descriptive. And that means it describes how people actually think. It doesn't assume that we process information like a computer. So we need to keep in mind that people don't always have the motivation or the ability to engage in central route processing. When people are engaging in peripheral route processing, they are not paying careful attention to the message. They are not carefully scrutinizing each persuasive appeal. And as a result, they're more influenced by superficial cues. These superficial cues are little mental shortcuts or little rules of thumb. Let's talk about some examples. So a person who's evaluating some type of persuasive appeal might not be paying a lot of attention to the message, but they might be paying some attention to the messenger. So if that person speaks very fluently, they might think to themselves, that person knows what they're talking about, I'm on board. Or of course, like we've talked about before, lots of products are associated with some type of attractive spokesperson. And if they like the attractive spokesperson, they might be persuaded by that appeal. They might change their mind about the product. They might simply say to themselves, well, that car has a good reputation. I don't necessarily need to know anything more about it. That's peripheral route processing. Other superficial cues that tend to be very influential when people are processing information via the peripheral route tend to be more closely associated with the message itself. So maybe the message has a lot of arguments that are being provided. And the person might just think to themselves, well, this person's got a lot to say. They must know what they're talking about. I'm on board. I'm persuaded. Or maybe there are a lot of statistical pieces of information and the person's dazzled by the numbers. So here would be a good example. Remember, when we were looking at that Porsche ad, there's tons of data there, tons of statistics about this car. And it's possible that someone who's not really carefully scrutinizing the message will just quickly look at all the numbers and think like, well, clearly this car is impressive. Clearly this car can perform. When people are processing persuasive appeals via the peripheral route, another superficial cue that's very commonly relied upon is a celebrity endorsement. So in this situation, if I'm looking for a volleyball, I might change my opinion about Wilson volleyballs because those volleyballs are being endorsed by Carrie Jennings Walsh, who's a three-time Olympic gold medalist. You can see that an ad like that doesn't tell me anything at all about the volleyball. It doesn't show me how that volleyball is different from other brands. I don't see any numbers to show how it performs. All I see is a picture of an Olympic gold medalist. And it's likely that most people who are buying volleyballs aren't really motivated to scrutinize a lot of information they just simply want to look to some type of peripheral cue to help them make their decision. Another good example of that has to do with just general support. So if I'm looking for a volleyball and I simply say to myself, like, well, most of my friends have a Wilson volleyball, again, that can change my view of Wilson volleyballs and I'd be more likely to buy them. All right, well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.